President Trump has announced plans to end family separation at the border. The left must be thrilled, right? This is what they've been asking for for months and months and years and years. But they're not thrilled because President Trump's immigration opponents never really cared about family separation or detention center conditions at all. They just want open borders. We will examine how President Trump called their bluff and what it means for border security. Then San Francisco politicians rebrand criminals as justice involved persons. <laughs> we will practice the latest PC jargon. Finally, big news. Another 2020 Democratic presidential candidate drops out and the field drops down to only 722 or so. All that and more. I'm Michael Knowles and this is The Michael Knowles Show. Breaking news. Before we get to the other news about family separation, we have got to get to this breaking news out of the 2020 presidential campaign. Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton is no longer running for president. And in other news, Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton was running for president, but now he is no longer. He is back to running for re-election to his House seat. Uh, he ended his campaign with a warning. This is what he said, quote, I think it's evident that this is now a three-way race between Biden, Warren, and Sanders. And really, it's a debate about how far left the party should go. I will say about Seth Moulton, I know that nobody heard about him, but I actually did because part of my job is I have to figure out who all the candidates are and look into them a little bit. And Seth Moulton was one of the more moderate candidates. He uh, had military service. He was a little bit more in the moderate lane of the Democratic Party. Never took off, never went anywhere. Now he's gone. He's dropping out and you never heard about him. I think that kind of answers his warning. His warning is how far left is the Democratic Party going to go? The answer is the only candidates who are left are very left wing. You've got Warren and Sanders who are legitimately far left radicals. And then you have Joe Biden who has really doesn't have any beliefs at all. At times in his career, he's positioned himself as a moderate. At other times, he's positioned himself as a far left candidate. And for most of this presidential campaign, he has uh, gone far to the left, even now uh, dropping his support for the Hyde Amendment and endorsing taxpayer funding for abortion. So I, it's a good warning from Seth Moulton, but we've already got the answer. The party is going to the left. We will get to the big news, though, on the border and the Trump administration's new immigration policy. But first, I have got to thank our friends over at Zip Recruiter. You need to find good employees. You need to find good quality employees. We're doing that right now in our presidential race. We, the people, are trying to find good quality employees who could run for president. If only we could apply ZipRecruiter to the presidency, we would not have the current field of candidates that we do. But uh, ZipRecruiter is incredible. It sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. They don't just stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applicants, come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one of them and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. Every other job board just about, you know, they, it's pretty much like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Maybe you never hear back about the job. Maybe you do, but you don't know who's coming in. ZipRecruiter is so effective. They are the best in the game that four out of five uh, employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. ZipRecruiter goes at it, keeps doing the job for you to find the best candidates. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So other than Seth Moulton, I'm glad you have gotten your composure back from this shock. You know, you pulled your cars off to the side of the road. You now know Seth Moulton is out of the race. Let's get to the big news today, which is President Trump calling the left's bluff on illegal immigration. He is doing this by ending the family separation policy, and he's doing that by ripping up the Flores Settlement Agreement, which in 1997 established the principle for family separation. Nobody knows anything about this in part because the, our immigration policy is so broken and backwards and I incomprehensible that no one looks into it, in part because presidents of both parties have not 
in actually enforced immigration law. And in part, because what the left wants you to believe is that President Trump instituted a family separation policy at the border. That's what they want you to believe. That isn't true. The family separation policy goes back 22 years, at least, to the Flores Agreement. Now, what, what President Trump is showing today is that the left's arguments are not in good faith. The left has been saying they, all they want to do is stop the family separation, but they don't care about family separation. They don't care about the kids being in the detention facilities. They just want open borders. So here's what happened. Decades ago, the left said immigration enforcement cannot detain children. They can't do it. Please, government, stop detaining children. So what did the government say? Okay, that's fine. They took the children out of immigration enforcement custody through something called the Flores Agreement. Then the left said, wait a second, wait a second, you can't separate families. You've got to stop separating families. So then President Trump and the government said, okay, we'll stop separating families. They put them back together. Now the left is saying you can't detain children. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Because what it's showing is that the left wants open borders. Here's how, here's how the left is re reacting to Trump's new policy, which ends family separation. Quote, New York Times, migrant families would face indefinite detention under new Trump rule. The New Yorker says, quote, the Trump administration's sustained attack on the rights of immigrant children. Miami Herald, new Trump administration rule would let feds detain immigrant children indefinitely. Washington Post, Trump administration moves to terminate the court agreement, hold migrant children and parents longer. Now, a more accurate headline would be, Trump gives the left exactly what they've been asking for in family separation. This, this proves that old rule, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. The left doesn't really care about the family separation. Here is a quick history of the left's immigration argument. You can just see just this breeze through from 1985 to the present, how they keep changing, how they keep moving the goalposts, how they keep trying to hide their real goal, which is open borders, and how they can no longer hide it. So beginning around 1985, two left-wing organizations sued the INS, which was the pre predecessor to ICE. That was the old immigration enforcement. And they sued over the detention of illegal alien children. And this was litigated for over a decade. So it goes through the end of the 80s, into the 90s, up until, uh, it goes all the way actually up to the Supreme Court. And then in 1997, the government and these pro-immigration, pro-illegal immigrant organizations come to a settlement. What does the settlement say? It says three things. It says the government is required to release children from immigration detention without unnecessary delay. And it goes in order of preference being beginning with parents and then to other adult relatives as well as licensed programs willing to accept custody if, if there's no one to grab them. Second thing the settlement says is with respect to children for whom a suitable placement is not immediately available, the government is obligated to place children in the least restrictive setting appropriate to their age and their needs. So you're not going to throw them in jail. You're going to put them in a separate facility that's nicer and more free and more liberated. Third thing that the settlement says is the government is required to implement standards relating to the care and treatment of children in immigrant detention. That's why they're not in jails, which have actually in America, they have very good standards, but they're in facilities that are even nicer. They have teddy bears, they get pizza and juice boxes, whatever, all these things. I'm not saying they're staying at the Shangri-La or the Ritz-Carlton, but they're staying in relatively nicer facilities as per this agreement. Now, what is not said in there, but what all of that means is the kids are separated from their families because the families are being held by immigration enforcement. But the, the agreement says the kids can't be held by immigration enforcement for that long. So the kids, it, it, as per the law, you have to take the kids and put them into different and ostensibly nicer conditions, which means taking them away from their families. Or it means just releasing their parents and letting them go. Right? Those are the only two options you can have. And what the left and what pro-illegal immigration conservatives and Republicans want to do I should say, I don't think there are many pro-illegal immigration conservatives, but what pro-illegal immigration Republicans and libertarians want to do is say, okay, just let them go. Just let them out, right? Let's not enforce the law. And it was a sort of unholy alliance between the left and the libertarians. Also, the agreement wasn't really implemented until a little bit later, until President Trump, and until today, the left admits their real goals. We'll get to that in a second, but first, 
Support for The Michael Knowles Show comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. You know that I live in Los Angeles. It's very difficult to find a house in LA, mostly because Shapiro pays me slave wages and every house in LA costs like a zillion dollars. However, when I do find a house, at least finding the right mortgage will be easy because Rocket Mortgage makes it easy. Their mortgage expert's number one goal is to make the home buying process smoother for you. That means industry-leaning online lending technology. Rocket Mortgage is there with award-winning client service and support every step of the way. For most people, buying a home is going to be the, the single most important financial decision you ever make in your life. If you're like me, you're a millennial and you don't know anything about anything practical like getting a mortgage, you know, paying your bills, doing your taxes. Getting a mortgage can be extraordinarily complicated. Don't go in blind. Don't go it alone. Go to the place with the highest customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination nine years in a row. Highest in mortgage servicing five years in a row. When you work with them, you get more than just a loan because Rocket Mortgage is more than just a lender. Go with them, guys. I am telling you, this is going to be a huge decision in your life. Don't go it without the best. Get started online at rocketmortgage.com slash Knowles, Canada W, L-E-S, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Push button, get mortgage. So they come to this Flores Agreement in 97. That establishes family separation, except it wasn't actually implemented through the end of the Clinton era or through the beginning of the Bush era. It's finally implemented in 2003 under George W. Bush when the Office of Refugee Resettlement takes over unaccompanied minors. Then, 2005, two years later, George W. Bush uh, issues what he calls a zero tolerance approach to illegal immigration. This is when finally conservatives are going to start taking illegal immigration seriously, right? He does it through a, a program called Operation Streamline. So they're going to take it seriously, except they don't. They don't. What, so what it means before is that the DOJ wasn't really prosecuting illegal immigration all that much, but even the zero tolerance policy didn't really do all that much. Why not? Because it made an exception for illegal aliens traveling with minors. So if you, what happens? We know how incentives work. If you create an exception to immigration enforcement, you've already got this big problem with illegal aliens coming in. You're going to get more of the behavior that you're incentivizing. So when Barack Obama takes over in 2009, he has an even looser approach to illegal immigration. He just releases the parents. So he has this habit of releasing the parents who come with the kids. What happens? Parents start flooding the border with their children. In 2014, you had a major crisis. O President Obama responded first by doing exactly what, what President Trump was doing, what, what President Trump was doing until just recently, which is separating the families and detaining the kids. And you got a few photos out of this of the so-called children in cages. And what's so unbelievable about the hypocrisy of the left on this is when they're protesting President Trump's immigration policy, they're sending around all these photos on social media. They went viral of kids in cages, but the photos aren't from 2017 or 2018 or 2019. The photos are from 2014 when Barack Obama was doing the exact same thing. There was no hubbub when Barack Obama did it. They don't care because they don't actually care about family separation. They don't care about quote unquote kids in cages. They just care about pressuring a conservative president to give us open borders. President Obama eventually just basically let illegal aliens go. And here you get the policy of catch and release. So you catch the illegal aliens pouring over the border of this country, but you can't detain them for very long, especially if they have kids. So since it takes years to hear these asylum claims, you arrest them, you bring them in, and then you just let them go. Because they're going to show up to their court hearings, right? In a couple months or a couple years, right? They're going to show up. No, of course not. You let them go, they disappear, they're in the country, and you have de facto, for all intents and purposes, open borders. Then Trump gets into office, he starts actually enforcing the law, he starts actually enforcing the Flores Agreement, the left throws a fit, they say we can't separate families, even though that's what the law says. So then Trump says, okay, we won't separate families, the left throws a fit, they say we can't detain kids. This shows the left's hand. The Democratic candidates for president say, with their words, they say they don't want open borders. Here's Julian Castro leading the charge. Open borders is just a right-wing talking point. It always has been. No, I don't support open borders. We do have a problem at the southern border. Democrats should not deny that we don't. Nations should have borders. Borders should be respected. 
increasing open borders. Open no, borders. That's a, that's a Koch brothers proposal. That's what they say with their words. Actually, the only one of those who ha- has sort of shown that he doesn't want completely open borders is Bernie Sanders because he says open borders drive down wages. But all the rest of them have said with their words, they don't want open borders. And then they call for decriminalizing border crossings. Cory Booker and Julian Castro both say we shouldn't treat entering this country illegally as a criminal matter. Now, this is obviously ridiculous. This is open borders. So they say one thing with their words at the same time, they are calling for uh, getting rid of our national sovereignty. They're calling for letting illegal aliens flood into this country. It's, it's mealy mouthed language. And what I love about what President Trump is doing now is first of all, I'm glad that this policy is not going to, there is now some workaround to separating the families. I mean, the law was you had to separate them. Now they're saying we're going to rip up the Flores agreement and we're going to detain parents with their kids. If it's really the, if it's really the parents and if, if it's really their kids in the first place, I think that's fine, but they are going to detain them. There, you can either detain them together, you can detain them separately, or you can let them go and have open borders. And of those three options, I'm glad we are choosing the former. I think that first option is the best one. Now the left either has to defend family separation or open borders. And they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to have both. I love that there's clarity on this. This is a great move. It shows President Trump is finally getting serious on immigration enforcement. After what, two years of not building the wall, not one inch of new wall. Finally, I've been saying this is a major vulnerability for him in 2020. If he doesn't get tough on it before then, he's going to have a lot of trouble making the pitch to his supporters. It looks like he's finally doing that. And if he is, I cheer it on. Good on you. Speaking of that mealy mouth language though, over in San Francisco, there is a whole bunch of politically correct language that has just come out from the board of supervisors over there. This doesn't have to do with illegal immigration necessarily. This has to do with crime generally in San Francisco. They announced in San Francisco has one of the highest crime rates in the country. They announced that they are going to finally tackle the issue of crime. You know how they're going to do it? Are they going to arrest the criminals? No. Are they going to clean up the streets? No. Are they going to enforce more laws and pass more laws? No, they're not going to do any of that. They're just going to stop calling them criminals. That'll do it. That'll do it. Why didn't I think of that? If you don't call criminals criminals, then you don't have any more criminals, right? That's the idea. What they're going to start doing now is changing all sorts of language around this issue. So juvenile delinquents, you know what the new, that's the bad term. You can't, bad kids, you can't call them that. Kids who commit crime, you can't call them that. Juvenile delinquents, you can't call them that. The new term is young persons impacted by the juvenile justice system. Now, Everybody is impacted by the juvenile justice system. Everyone who lives in this society is impacted by it because that's the system to take bad kids out who are committing crimes. Drug addicts, are, they're not drug addicts anymore. They're not even substance abusers, which was the new politically correct term just a few years ago. Now they are persons with a history of substance abuse. And then criminals and convicts. This is my favorite one of all. Criminals and felons, convicts, they they are now, quote, justice involved persons. This is my favorite PC jargon of all because it is actually the opposite of the truth. Criminals are not justice involved persons. Criminals by definition are injustice involved persons. They are committing injustices, not justices. It would be like San Francisco referring to their their epidemic of drug and feces infested streets as sanitation involved sidewalks. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but this is what PC does. You know, instead of solving the problem, instead of grappling with reality, these politicians in San Francisco think that they can just change the name because it's a lot easier. Think about how the left did this. They've done this for years and years and years. Barack Obama runs for president in 2008. He says he's going to end these wars in the Middle East. So he gets into office. Does he end the wars? No. He actually launches more wars in the Middle East, but he doesn't call them wars. He calls them, quote, overseas contingency operations. So there you go. That's one way to end a war. You just stop calling it a war and then it's not a war anymore, right? They do this with illegal aliens. 
with millions and millions, at least 11 million, probably many more, foreign nationals illegally living in this country. How are we going to deal with that problem? We could either deal with the actual problem or we can do what the left does, which is just pretend that they're not foreign nationals. We can use the term undocumented Americans, which has now been adopted by a lot of left-wingers. So there's no more foreigners in the country, right? Because they're not, they're, they're undocumented Americans, so they can't be foreigners, right? Same thing, I mean, the biggest cultural issue of the day, even though it only affects a small number of people, it dominates our discourse, transgenderism. Instead of actually getting help for men who are confused about their biological sex, the left just uses PC language to rebrand them as transgender women. So now they're not men who have a problem, a psychological problem. They're just, they're, they're women, kind of, in a way, with the language. This kind of PC jargon is offensive to language. I mean, it's offensive from a linguistic point of view, but it's also just offensive to people. If I were in San Francisco, I would be really upset because you elect politicians to reduce crime. You address them to do what you want them to do. You address, you elect them to pass policies that will be good for your community. But it's hard to do that. You have to make difficult decisions. You have to show leadership and courage and moral vision. And the San Francisco politicians don't have any of that. So instead what they're doing is they're just pretending the problem doesn't exist at all. This was a huge reason that people voted for President Trump in 2016. They voted for him for the border. They voted for him for the economy. They voted for him for trade. They vote, sure. Largely, I think they voted for him because he came out and he said, political correctness is killing this country. And I'm not going to be politically correct. I don't have time to be politically correct. I talked to people even before I liked Trump in the primaries, back when I was, I was supporting Ted Cruz. I would talk to some of my friends. They say, we love Trump. I'd say, I'm skeptical of Trump. I don't know. He's donated to Democrats. He seems like a little bit liberal. He talks kind of funny. I'm not sure that I support Trump. They said, we need Trump because Trump will defeat political correctness. So what, what does that mean? I don't elect politicians for those cultural reasons. I elect them for policies. But my friends were right. Political correctness is so awful. It's just lies. It's just deception. When people use politically correct jargon, they are just trying to deceive you. They are using soft euphemisms to confuse you about difficult concepts that they want you to swallow, whole premises they want you to take over. This is a, a real danger to the country. You know, when people use that, you, you got to be on your guard. There, no criminal is going to be reformed by you pretending he's not a criminal. We have 10,000 prisoners getting out of state and federal prisons every day in this country. We should reintegrate them into society. We should prevent them from going to prison in the first place. One way we could do that is by starting at home, fixing broken families. You have huge rates of single parents, huge rates of out of wedlock birth. And people who are raised in a home without a father are multiples more likely to commit crime to end up in prison. Tackle those issues. That's harder. It's not as easy as changing the language, but that's what we're electing people to do. That's what we're here in this country to do. Turning to other big news, this actually does matter in terms of po politics, even though it's a minor news story, it seems. Libertarian billionaire and political funder David Koch has died of cancer. He is one of the Koch brothers. And speaking of leftist deception, it is unbelievable how his death is being covered in the left-wing media and the mainstream media. Shows you a lot about how the left perceives anybody even slightly to the right of them. David Koch was a, a billionaire libertarian. He was a major philanthropist. He gave $1.3 billion to charity over his career. And leftists from Hollywood types to pundits to CNN contributors are celebrating, cheering on his death. Some idiot from Slate, Jordan Weissman, said that he hopes that David Koch's soul suffers for eternity. Some alleged left-wing comedian has, I don't remember her name, but she has like a million Twitter followers. She joked about how Koch was a Nazi. They don't even know who David Koch is. David Koch wasn't that conservative. He was a libertarian. He really loved individual liberty. In some ways, he was even kind of a left libertarian. He supported abortion. He supported redefining marriage. He supported stem cell research. He supported decriminalizing drugs. He supported non-interventionist foreign policy. He sat on the board of the Cato Institute and the Reason Foundation. These are libertarian outlets. They don't care. They call him a Nazi. I mean, David Koch was actually the opposite of a Nazi, right? He was a complete libertarian. 
even the, the usual issues that the left uses to try to call us Nazis and portray, portray conservatives as Nazis don't apply to David Koch because he was actually pretty liberal on a lot of issues. What it shows you, it doesn't matter what concessions you give the left. It doesn't matter if you try to be really nice or you give them one issue or you give them this issue or you're a good guy or you give a billion dollars to charity. How much have any of his critics ever given to charity? Like nothing, I bet. Doesn't matter. It actually does tie in a little bit to what we were talking about yesterday, about the people who are conservative, but not that kind of conservative. You know, the people who they're sort of conservative, but they, they agree with the left on some things and they want the left to like them. Now, I'm not accusing Charles Koch of doing that. Charles Koch was his own man. He believed what he believed. He was a rock-ribbed libertarian and didn't pretend to be otherwise. But the way the left treated him, the way they smear him as anybody to the right of, I don't know, Hillary Clinton. Now, anybody to the right of Joe Biden is some kind of Nazi, awful. To, there's no way that you are ever going to get their approval or their love. So you can be like Coke and you actually just be a libertarian and go out, do what you believe and not really care what they say about you. Or if you are a conservative, get the lesson. Stop sucking up to the left. They are not going to like you. We have to get to, speaking of fake news, speaking to the way the left deceives, not just with language, not just with the opposite of eulogies, not just with their celebrations and dancing on graves, but with the coverage of a major news story that is so false over in the Amazon. Before we get to that, I've got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. By the way, The Daily Wire has turned four years old and we are thrilled. As a thank you to our fans, we are giving away one month of our premium monthly subscription to anyone who uses the code BIRTHDAY. Now, you can do that uh, right now. We, uh, we absolutely support, or thank you rather, for all of the support you have made us get to four years. We couldn't have done it without you. We want to thank you with that. So if you haven't subscribed yet, go on over. You'll get a month free and it's a lot of fun. We got a lot of stuff behind that paywall. And of course, you can get your Leftist Tears Tumblr with an annual subscription. Head on over to dailywire.com. We'll be right back with a lot more. Okay, I want to get to this story about how the Amazon is burning. The Amazon rainforest, it's going to burn to the ground. We're not going to have any oxygen. We're not going to have any more wildlife in the whole world. It's terrible and it's all being caused by conservatives somehow. I'm not quite sure how. Or it's being caused by global warming or something and it's never, okay. This is the narrative that you're seeing. Pray for the Amazon. National leaders, Emmanuel Macron in France, Merkel in Germany, all talking about this, largely based on fake news. So we'll get to that in a second. But first, my pal Charlie Kirk stopped by. Charlie Kirk is the head of the Students for Trump. He is the head of TPUSA. He is always on an airplane flying around rallying young conservative support all around America. He came by in LA. And so we did a, sat down for probably 35, 40 minute interview. You will be able to get that tomorrow. We're going to release that. But I wanted to give you just a little bit, six or seven minutes of it, uh, of sitting down with Charlie Kirk, incredibly interesting guy. So we'll get to him and then we will get to the Amazon jungle. It occurs to me, you're speaking obviously very in religious terms, and this is traditional for conservatives, especially in that post-war conservative movement. You had the libertarians, the traditionalists, the religious right, you had the communism hawks. They were all against this, this common enemy, which was the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The Cold War ends. Then what? What does the conservative movement look like That's now? such a great question. So the, the Soviet Union kept them all together. Is what, that, that's why Reagan was able to build this coalition in 1980 and take over the party that he wasn't supposed to ever be at the nominee of. Right. I mean, in 76, Reagan tried to overthrow uh, sitting President Gerald Ford in 1976, and he got to the convention floor and sort of half endorsed him, didn't really endorse him. But Reagan was a rebel. And the reason why Ray, people thought Reagan was going to lose in a landslide to Jimmy Carter, and he won surprisingly. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he was the one that crushed the Soviet Union. So what is our Soviet Union today? Well, it's the left in our country. Mm. The Soviet Union is no longer headquartered in Moscow. They're in Montana, Michigan, Mississippi, and Missouri. <laughs> They're everywhere. And, and only on the university campuses. Right. Well, it's epicenter of And then in, in Hollywood and all this other. So, so look, the, the coalition that we have to build, though, yeah. that Reagan got correct mm -hmm. and Trump gets correct, and I feel that our movement gets wrong so often, is we have to break and, and you understand this, we have to break our shackles away from these coastal elitists in universities and these think tanks that think 
that if you're a carpenter, a pipe fitter, or you didn't go to four-year college, you're somehow less than worthy to have be engaged in the American conversation. Right. Right. That's where Reagan was successful. That's where Trump is successful. And I feel as if there's this elitism that permeates our movement, where all of a sudden that if you didn't go to the correct university in the upper Northeast corridor, right. any opinion you have is what? Well, it's deplorable. It's all this. And the left says it. Our people don't. But you know what it is? It's also an emperor has no clothes mm -hmm. situation because having gone to one of those correct universities in the Northeast Corridor. And I didn't go to one of them. And you didn't go to one of them. I didn't go to any of you them. You didn't go to any of them, but you do have an honorary degree. Yes, from you, Liberty University. From Liberty. Everybody should go to Liberty. University. Yes. But, you know, having gone there, I can kind of see what's happened to it, what the left has done to these universities, which is to hollow them out from within. So it's not to say that there's nothing to be gained at any of these places, but what it is to say is the institution that's hobbling around and it looks like Harvard or Yale and it talks like Harvard or Yale, it isn't what it used to be. The left has gone on a long march through the institutions. And so what you mm -hmm. are getting in the end is something that's simply not as academically serious, scholarly, scholarly rigorous. You're not getting that same quality of education. No. So you have whole generations who are uneducated, uncultured, yes. and they're so damn convinced that they're the smartest people yeah, in the world. but they're hyper-credentialed. Hyper-credentialed. So, right. so they have all the degrees, but they know nothing. Right. And they often have a lot of student debt. Right. So they're, they're, they're in debt, they're vulnerable, and they have degrees up the wazoo, and they, they, there's no wisdom, there's no yeah. knowledge, there's right. no history, no perspective. No humility. <laughs> no, well, definitely not. They're constantly wrong, but they're never in doubt. <laughs> That's exactly and right. So, so you, you mix all this together. So look, here's what the movement moving forward is. Number one, we have to dominate in the libertarians. I know you and I might not see eye to eye on all this, but I'm a okay. little I'm a little less libertarian, that's okay. but I, I do see the point. Do we, I mean, this is my question to you. Sure. Do we need to hold together the exact same coalition? No, we have to rebuild a new one. Okay. And so my coalition, is, number one, I think we have to, libertarians, I think those are ours to get. These guys hate government, yeah. personal freedom, and there's, conversa there's robust conversations we can have about all that sort of stuff. There's stuff that we should not compromise on. So like a pro-choice libertarian, sorry, not going to happen, not, right? Yeah, but, not welcome. But, but like if you want to go put some substance in your body that I've never done and I don't even know where to find, go ahead. Like I don't care, right? So as long as you have some to share. Yeah. What, what, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So that, that's one. So libertarians, okay. those are our people, okay? We shouldn't lose that. Number two is is any sort of person that goes to has religion as a core, core, core part of their 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 day or their their life, their the, identity. That that's yeah. these are our people. Yeah. Okay. And that it should be actually four or five. Number three, the other part of the coalition, is um, people that wake up before seven a.m. No, I'm not kidding. Every human being in America that wakes up before 7 a.m. should be a Republican. <laughs> well, that's good. And then we should limit the vote to be over at about 8 a.m. And then we win. There are no, I'm not kidding. Problems if, 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 and I say that somewhat jokingly. But if you're getting up early and you yeah. really got to gotta really muster some strength to go to work, you're, you're one of us. I don't care if you're a carpenter, a teacher, a pipe fitter. You're not a leftist. Even a hedge fund manager. No, but like, okay, of course. But again, there's, there's 50 of them. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm talking about the 50,000 teachers in yeah. Missouri that we've never talked to. Yep. And they're working their tail off, right? Mm -hmm. And again, this comes to this hyper elitism. So if you're waking up early and you got to really fight and you got to, you're our people. Like yep. that's, I want our party yep. to be the, 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 the hard work nation party. Like mm -hmm. that's us. And the final thing is, is the doctrinaire conservatives. And, and there's about eight or 10 million of these people. And they're the ones that listen to Ben, they listen to Rush, and you know, yeah. they're, they're the Tea Party folks. They, they buy all the books. They, those are right. our folks. I love those people, right? And that's our coalition. Okay. If you combine libertarians, which our, gen our generation is becoming increasingly libertarian, religious, hardworking, conservatives, that's 65 million people. You'll win any election you can with that. Let them go after all the people that sleep until 10 and do whatever the hell they want. Like, I don't care about those people, right? right I right. do care about them. I don't care about their votes. Like, I don't want to build a co let me make myself go. I care about them as people. I don't like. I don't want to build a political party around people that sleep all day and do nothing. Of course, yeah. I mean, they're not really reliable when you need to go out and knock on doors. But and you know what I'm saying, it's right? But the, of I, that, that's a movement I think that can have robust debate and can be and can be one that can win the future and make our country a better place. Now you know we're gonna have the rest of the interview out tomorrow, so you can check it out. I know Charlie really likes the coalition of people who wake up before seven because that guy never sleeps. He is just the biggest ball of energy I have ever seen. He's like bouncing off the walls. One time, I, I think it might have been the first time I met him. I was in a Fox green room in LA and it was 3.30 or 4 in the morning. And I'm there, you know, because the East Coast Fox and Friends 
is on the West Coast, it's 4 a.m. And so I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm like half asleep, kind of drooling. I've got like espresso stained on my face. Charlie bounces in. He comes like bouncing off all the walls. He's like, hey, buddy, Michael Knowles, nice to see you. Blah, blah, blah. You know, so uh, it's great. I really always love talking to him. He's got a great vision for the future of the country. He talks to a ton of of uh, young people, Gen Z and millennials all over. So go check it out. We had a really great time. Before we go, I want to talk about this story out of the Amazon. You've probably heard from the mainstream media, you've seen it on social media, that the Amazon rainforest is burning to the ground. There's no, it's basically, there's no more Amazon jungle left. It's all gone and it's caused by Republicans and conservatives and global warming or something, right? This is an example of a lie getting all the way around the world before the truth has the time to put its pants on. The, you know, the actual quote that that line is based on is from Jonathan Swift. And the, the line is, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it. And that's what's happening. The truth is coming limping after here. And it, it's too late because the images have already penetrated. What is true? It's true that parts of the Amazon are on fire. It's even true that humans are likely causing that fire those fires. But parts of the Amazon catch fire all the time. People burn parts of the forests. I mean, you kind of regularly have to do that. And then people are doing it also to clear some land, to raise meat and other things. Most of what you're seeing on social media, the photos of the fires, are not actually of the current fires. Some of those are 30 years old. Some of the pictures you're seeing are of fires and forests that aren't even the Amazon. One photo is from last year. One photo is from 20 years ago. One of the prominent photos is from 1989. What this social media hysteria is really about is not about the Amazon having some fires. It's about leftist opposition to President Bolsonaro, who's a conservative sort of Trumpist figure who was just elected in Brazil. We're seeing the exact same thing in the United States on the exact same talk topic we were talking about at the top of the show. Left-wing pundits, celebrities, news outlets, constantly spreading around these photos of the kids in cages. And, the ch and those photos of the kids in cages, it, it's true. There are some children who have been detained, illegal aliens who have come over and have been detained. It's true that there are photos of this. But the main photos going around, spread even by news outlets, are from 2014 when Barack Obama was doing it. And yet they're blaming it on Trump because the social media frenzy is not about kids in cages. The social media frenzy is not about the family separation policy. The social media frenzy is about leftist opposition to President Trump. There are a few good lessons to take away from this. One, context matters. People, I think in politics, People just want these, they make these grand statements that are supposed to be eternally true, that are always at their logical extreme. And that's just not how politics works. Politics is about context. It's about circumstance. Politics literally is just how men relate to one another in the city, how they re relate to one another in civil society. That's the first lesson. The second one is it's good to keep perspective in politics. Whenever I see something that's supposed to be some big outrage, I take a breath. Whenever I read some report of the Trump tweet, oh no, the tweet, the world is going to end. I just, uh, I just take a little breath. Whenever I see even something that is, uh, I don't know, the worst leftist doing the worst thing imaginable, I look at it, I say, okay, take a breath, then I'm going to see what this actually means. Because that's what propaganda is, is when people on either the left or the right, or from any political point of view, are using information and images to get a reaction out of you. And I don't want to be played like that. Sometimes I, you know, I give these college lectures at uh, the universities around the country and I get all these crazy things being yelled at me by leftist students and I stay pretty calm. Or if I go and do a debate on TV or something like that, I, I usually stay pretty calm. And the reason I stay pretty calm is not because I have some superhuman power to resist leftist hysteria. It's because I realize this important lesson number two, perspective matters in politics. People are constantly trying to em emotionally manipulate you in politics. That's pretty much the definition of politics. You need to keep perspective just for your own self-preservation. Third thing you got to believe here, third lesson, don't believe everything that you see on the internet or that you hear on the internet. That's kind of, I'm telling you on the internet, 
not to believe everything you hear on the internet, but you know, look it up, see what I'm talking about. Google it. This is very important. You always see this meme going around of Abraham Lincoln. That's an old photo of Abraham Lincoln, you know, from the 1860s. And it says, uh, don't believe everything you read on the internet because often it's lies. Abraham Lincoln, right? And that this kind of shows you that. I mean, every time I see a quote on the internet, I Google the quote probably seven or eight times out of 10. It's a spurious quotation. The person who said it didn't really say it. I saw it today. There was a quotation going around from Thomas Jefferson. He never said it. He said something that was sort of like it, but he never said it. This is true of so many. Churchill quotations, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams. Just look them up. Don't believe everything. Be a little skeptical. Now, I'm probably preaching to the choir because if you're listening to this show, you're probably a little bit conservative. Maybe you're a centrist or a Democrat, but you've got a conservative bent to you. And so you're, you're probably naturally skeptical. The left is naturally gullible. And I think it's why they fall for all these kind of things. You shouldn't fall for it. Always be skeptical. Another great thing heading into the weekend, go check out my, my interview with Charlie Kirk tomorrow. A great uh, little article in the Wall Street Journal, though I really enjoyed it this morning, was from Peggy Noonan. Peggy Noonan was a speechwriter for uh, Reagan and, and then for Bush. And she writes in the journal and her, the thing I loved about this column is it's not about politics and it's not about immigration. It's not about trade and it's not about foreign policy. It's about a bigger long-term issue that is hurting our country, which is rudeness. People are just rude. They don't have manners. And this ties in with what we were talking about on political correctness, because what the left wants you to believe is that political correctness is politeness, but it's not. Political correctness is not polite at all. Political correctness is lies, and lies are never polite. Lies are very impolite. You know, I pointed out I was on a Fox show earlier today, and I said, political correctness is so crazy because they'll attack you for using basically the same word, and then they'll praise you for using the same word. So if I say a person is colored, he's a colored person, that is horribly offensive. You cannot possibly say that word today. However, if you, I, I say that someone is a person of color, that is the right term. That is not only a, an acceptable term, that is the preferred term. If you say anything else, you're terribly offensive. They're the same thing. It is exactly 100% the same to call someone a colored person or a person of color. But what the censors do on the politically correct left is they say one is horrifically bigoted and offensive, the other one is polite. Which one is which? I don't know. You can barely keep track. Politeness is different. Politeness is not using language to pummel somebody, to control somebody, to shut somebody up. Politeness is taking care for people and being kind to them. Tipping your hat, holding the door open, referring to someone as Mr. or Mrs. This is something that has been completely lost. You know, it reminds me how in a traditional culture where we have traditional religion, traditional culture, and traditional politics, things make sense. And then when we say our politics is awful, we have to deconstruct it. We have to get rid of it. We have to oppose it. We're being oppressed. Our culture is oppressive. Our religion is oppressive. You get rid of all of it, right? We've been doing this now for at least 50 years. It's not like you just have nothing then because human beings need politics. We need culture and we have a religious longing for God. So instead, when you have that vacuum, it just gets filled with nonsense. So when you get rid of politeness, what you get is political correctness. And that is so awful. It's so gross and corrosive. So give it a read and then, you know, be polite. Check out the interview tomorrow with Charlie. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you soon. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Rebecca Dobkowitz, director Mike Joyner, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our senior producer is Jonathan Hay, supervising producer Mathis Glover, Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Editor, Danny D'Amico. Our audio mixer is Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey everyone, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know the saying, go woke, go broke? Man, I hope that's true. But America's top CEOs are now saying that businesses have to stop thinking about business so much and do some of that virtue stuff they've heard so much about. We'll talk about it on The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm Andrew Clavin.